Um, good morning, everyone, uh, my, and welcome to the uh, session uh, organized by Center for uh, Living Organ Donation uh, today that is titled Access to Liver Transplantation. Uh, I'm very fortunate uh, to have along today with me a panel of uh, um, experts who are going to talk on various aspects of access in terms of um, ethnicity to um, organ donation. Uh, my name is Nazia Selzner. I am the medical director of the live donor program uh, at uh, TGH, and I'm moderating this session today. Um, I'm gonna introduce one by one in more details uh, all our speakers this morning, but very briefly along with me, I have Dr. Jennifer Fleming from uh, Kingston, uh, Queens University. I have Dr. Nat Natasha Chandok uh, from University of Western Ontario, who is currently working uh, in Brampton. And I have um, Colleen Yin uh, from the Toronto Center from uh, Liver Disease. Um, today's uh, speaking is, uh, session is uh, being recorded and uh, will be available in the Center for Living Organ Donations YouTube um, channel. And uh, everyone is uh, welcome to send uh, uh, their question along using the Slido. So um, here, uh, without further ado, we are gonna start uh, our session today. Um, um, I don't, um, again, uh, the, our first uh, speaker is gonna be Dr. Je Jennifer Fleming. She's going to talk on the burden of cirrhosis uh, in Ontario. And Dr. Fleming is a transplant hepatologist and a hepatologist. She is an associate professor of uh, medicine at Queen's University. Uh, she has a, a long-standing um, and focused research uh, on the epidemiology and natural history of liver cirrhosis. Uh, in, um, including uh, hepatitis C and primary liver cancers. Um, and she's going to walk us through her presentation today, which is the burden of cirrhosis in Ontario. Uh, Jennifer, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Nazia, and thank you to uh, everyone who's joined in on this webinar um, today. And what I'm going to be talking to be about today is aspects related to the burden of cirrhosis in Ontario. Um, so the objectives that I have for uh, my talk are first, I'm going to review some of the basics about cirrhosis, just to make sure everybody is familiar with the condition. Next, I'm going to be talking about some work that we have done in Ontario, looking at the current and the future epidemiology of cirrhosis. And then to finish the talk, I'm going to be showing some preliminary data that we have looking at the contribution of both immigrant and refugee populations to cirrhosis epidemiology in Ontario. So to start, I just wanted to review uh, for the audience, what is cirrhosis? So cirrhosis is the final common pathway of multiple different chronic liver diseases. On the left-hand side here, this is a normal appearing liver without any scarring or chronic damage to it. What happens in the development in, of cirrhosis in an individual who has a chronic liver disease, over many years, there's ongoing insult and inflammation that occurs within the liver. And the reaction that the liver has to that is to try and repair itself and regenerate the liver. But in the process of doing that, what can happen is scar tissue or what we call fibrosis starts to develop uh, within the liver. And therefore, when this process goes on uh, over a span of 10 to 20 years, a proportion of individuals who have chronic liver disease will go on to develop cirrhosis or end-stage fibrosis of the liver. 
When we as physicians and healthcare providers uh, define cirrhosis, it's really based on what we would see under the microscope in an individual where we've done a liver biopsy. And this is just to highlight that in a normal liver, which is here on the left-hand side, if we took a piece of the liver and looked at it under the microscope, you can see that there's many cells of the liver that make up its structure, but there's not a lot of blue material here. What happens when you start to develop fibrosis or scarring of the liver, as you see here, there's the development of this blue material within the liver uh, parenchyma, and that scar tissue that develops. So when we talk about staging a chronic liver disease, we're really talking about how much scarring has developed in the liver over time. And what the definition of cirrhosis is, is when you take a biopsy of the liver and you see that there begins to develop these circular bands of scar tissue within the liver, that by definition is cirrhosis. And as mentioned, this usually occurs asymptomatically or people um, may be unaware that they're having a chronic liver disease because it doesn't make them feel unwell. But this can occur over 10 to 30 years and in a, as mentioned in a proportion of individuals they will go on to develop end-stage scarring or liver cirrhosis. These are the most common causes of cirrhosis in the North American population. Historically we always thought that uh, hepatitis C was the most common cause of liver disease but now it's become clear that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLD is the most common cause of chronic liver disease and cirrhosis in our population followed by alcohol related disease, hepatitis C and hepatitis B with these conditions making up approximately 80% of all causes of chronic liver disease. However there's other conditions that we see there's autoimmune conditions such as autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cholangitis, and primary sclerosing cholangitis, as well as other hereditary conditions such as hereditary hemochromatosis, Wilson disease, and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and then other more rare causes. But in the majority of individuals who we would see it within a liver clinic, 80% of them will have one of these top four um, causes of cirrhosis. Now, when we diagnose somebody with cirrhosis, there's a spectrum of disease. Most, in, a lot of individuals uh, will be diagnosed in the compensated phase, which is clinically silent without symptoms. And if you have cirrhosis without any complications, the average survival in these individuals can be between 10 to 12 years. However, once you enter what we call a decompensated phase or a phase where there are signs of liver failure that start to develop in somebody with cirrhosis, this really uh, increases individuals' risk of death and dying with the average survival in individuals with decompensated cirrhosis at less than three years on average. This slide is just showing what we would typically see in the natural history of chronic liver diseases. An individual has a chronic liver disease and over time may develop compensated cirrhosis. And then there's a risk once you have compensated cirrhosis that you will progress to decompensated cirrhosis. And this occurs on average about a, in about 5% of individuals per year. So if you took 100 individuals with compensated cirrhosis, approximately five of them every year would develop uh, a decompensation event. And the decompensation events uh, that we most commonly see can either be variceal hemorrhage or bleeding from esophageal varices, the development of ascites or fluid in the belly, encephalopathy, which is related to confusion. Individuals are at risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a primary liver cancer, or hepatorenal syndrome, which relates to kidney failure. However, interestingly, in individuals with decompensated cirrhosis, there's also a chance that this decompensation could improve if you're able to treat the underlying chronic liver disease, which is driving these decompensation. That includes alcohol abstinence in patients with alcohol-related liver disease. Treatment of both chronic hepatitis B and C can improve um, individuals' liver function, as well as the use of steroids for things such as autoimmune hepatitis. And so this is not a one-way path. Individuals can cycle through going through stages of both compensated and decompensated cirrhosis during the natural history. However, once you do develop decompensated cirrhosis, that's when your risk of death really increases. The analogy that I like to use when I'm uh, teaching medical learners or patients about cirrhosis is I use the analogy that if you have compensated cirrhosis, it's like you have a 20 or 30 year old car. 
It's not like a brand new one off the lot. It's a little bit rusty. The interior may not be as nice as the other ones. But as long as the car is still driving on the road, you don't necessarily need to trade it in. However, you need to take care of it. You need to bring it in for its oil checks and for um, its annual rust check in order to keep it in tip top condition. But what can happen with these old cars or in an individual with compensated cirrhosis, you can develop a decompensation event. And that's really when the wheels fall off. And then the question is, are we able to repair the car and get it back on the road and keep it functioning? Or is it time that we need to think about a liver transplant and trading in your old car for a brand new one? So I'm going to be switching gears now to talk about why understanding trends in both the current and future cirrhosis epidemiology is important. And just to clarify, epidemiology relates to disease trends over time within a certain population. Well, there's many different reasons why this is important. First, Understanding what's happening to the disease burden of cirrhosis helps to identify key exposures which lead to chronic liver disease within specific regions or in populations. This information can also help with education and development of strategies to identify chronic liver disease early in its course where it may be modifiable and treatable. It also helps with the implementation of disease management programs and therapeutics for individuals who are identified with chronic liver disease. And specifically related to liver transplantation, understanding what's happening with cirrhosis epidemiology can help to assess for changes in prevention efforts and facilitate future healthcare resource planning, such as the need for liver transplantation. So how can we figure out who in Ontario is living with cirrhosis? As we're all aware, Ontario is a, is a large province, which is home to over 14 million individuals. And so it'd be very difficult to go door to door and try and figure out who has underlying chronic liver disease to try and describe these trends in disease burden over time. So what uh, my research team has been doing over the past number of years is using health services research to try and understand what's going on with cirrhosis epidemiology. And what health services research refers to is the use of large scale population data on patient characteristics and healthcare use that helps us to describe patterns and uncover important associations that helps to generate research ideas or influence healthcare policy. So in order to conduct this work, I use the databases of ICES. So ICES is an independent nonprofit corporation within Ontario, and there's many different sites within Ontario, mostly at all academic centers, including University of Toronto, Queens, where I'm from, Western, where Dr. Chandok is, McMaster, as well as Ottawa. And what the ICES databases um, encompass are data that's collected through routine clinical administration of Ontario's publicly funded healthcare system. So anytime any individual goes in Ontario who's covered under OHIP goes and uses healthcare uh, resources within Ontario, this data is collected. The data that is contained in these databases includes information from physician services, such as visits to the outpatient clinics, the inpatient hospitalizations, as well as the emergency room. There's data from Cancer Care Ontario, the Ontario Drug Benefit Claims, which has information on medications dispense, the registered persons database, which gives us information on individual's age, date of birth, and date of death, plus many other databases, which allows us to get a lot of information on a lot of individuals within Ontario. Ontario. So this is what how I like to portray um, how we do work within ICES. So these colored bottle caps represent multiple different pieces of information on multiple individuals within Ontario that is stored within these databases. And just looking at the data when um, on its own, it's, it doesn't give you a lot of information. However, when you use health service research techniques and you understand how to look at the data and analyze it, you can transform this data into things that will uh, give you nice patterns and pictures of what's happening within uh, the population of Ontario. So what we did was we identified all individuals in Ontario who were diagnosed with cirrhosis between the year 2000 and 2017. And the purpose of this slide is just to show you the burden of disease with almost 160,000 individuals identified over this time period. 
and we were able to assign each individual a suspected cause of their chronic liver disease, which led to cirrhosis. Most commonly, we saw patients with NAFLD, as well as alcohol-related liver disease, and then viral hepatitis, autoimmune, and other diseases um, were grouped uh, together. And importantly, as I'm going through, uh, especially in the third part of my talk, um, there was a large proportion of individuals with cirrhosis as Ontario who were immigrants or refugees, representing 14% of the population. So as mentioned, we identified all of these individuals with cirrhosis in Ontario from 2000 to 2017, assigned them a cause of liver disease, and we also defined a birth cohort. This is important because um, the majority of the exposures that lead to chronic liver disease, such as alcohol-related disease, hepatitis, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, are influenced by external factors such as lifestyle and environmental um, exposures, which can change over time depending on when you were born. And therefore, you can uncover important epidemiologic trends based on external factors that may be influencing the number of individuals with cirrhosis. Then what we did is we used this information to describe what's been going on over the past 20 years, and then we wanted to predict what is going to happen to new cases of cirrhosis in Ontario up to the year 2040 to help with um, healthcare resource planning. The next number of slides, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking specifically about a cause of chronic liver disease leading to cirrhosis. And then I'm going to be talking about the burden of disease within these birth cohorts. So you'll see here on the y-axis here, I'll be talking about the incidence rate, and that is the number of new cases of uh, cirrhosis within the population. Down here is the year. So these first um, line graphs will be showing what we calculated from 2000 until 2017. And then what we've did is we've broken it down based on when an individual was born. So here in the blue are individuals born before 1928. In the red between 1928 and 1945. The green shows the baby boomer birth cohort between 1945 and 1964. Uh, the orange shows Generation X, 1965 to 1980. And then the light gray shows those individuals born after 1980 or the millennial generation. So this first slide is looking at individuals with NAFLD cirrhosis. So these are new cases that were observed within Ontario between 2000 and 2017. And you can see that within all age groups, the number of individuals diagnosed with cirrhosis went up over time. The average increase per year was 3.3% overall. And the highest increase in new cases of NAFLD cirrhosis were actually seen for females within the baby boomer birth cohort where the number of new cases increased by almost 9% per year. Then when we look at projecting using these estimates and saying, okay, well, what will we expect over the next 20 years if nothing happens uh, within our population? The number of individuals with newly diagnosed NAFLD cirrhosis is expected to increase by, increase by another 24%, and this will be going up in all birth cohorts. The highest increase we expect to be for women in, within Generation X, born between 1965 and 1980, and we estimate that the burden of disease within these individuals is going to increase by almost 350% over the next 20 years. So next, I'm going to switch to looking at alcohol-related cirrhosis. Again, we've broken this down by birth cohort, and these are what we've seen between 2000 and 2017. And though overall, the, uh, the number of new cases declined by minus 1.2% over the study period, you can see that this is different based on when you were born. Whereas there was a decline in older birth cohorts represented by the red and the blue, and a stabilization in the uh, baby boomer birth cohort. You can see that within younger generations, the number of new cases of alcohol-related cirrhosis increased over the study period. 
And the greatest increase was seen for individuals who were born after 1980, so millennials. So these are young individuals. And the increase um, in the rate of cirrhosis was almost 12% per year in this group. When projecting what's going to happen over the next 20 years, there's going to be an overall increase in alcohol-related cirrhosis by 15%, mostly driven by these younger individuals. And we looked at specific subgroups in the millennial birth cohort in males born after 1980, it's expected it will increase by over 400% for men and over 300% for females. Now looking at uh, hepatitis C related cirrhosis. So this is a viral hepatitis where recently we've been able to um, offer curative, well-tolerated treatments for individuals. Although over the past 20 years, there's been an increase in HCV related cirrhosis by 4.1% per year. You can see that the greatest increase was within the baby boomer birth cohort, which is not unexpected as this is where the highest prevalence of hepatitis C is. But you can see here after the approval and access to well-tolerated effective antivirals, which are able to cure hepatitis C, we're starting to see a decline in new cases of HCV related cirrhosis within this birth cohort. However, interestingly, we've also seen an increase of HCV-related cirrhosis in younger birth cohorts, which we hypothesize is likely reflective of the ongoing opioid epidemic within North America, as that is a common uh, route of infection of chronic hepatitis C. And again, concerningly about these younger individuals and men born after 1980, rates of HCV cirrhosis increased highest at approximately 10% per year. Projecting over the next uh, 20 years, fortunately, there's an expected decline overall in new cases of HCV-related cirrhosis by almost 50%. However, again, if you look at different age groups, in those individuals born after 1980, there's uh, a projected ongoing increase of new cases that will be seen over the next uh, 40 years. Therefore, although we've made a lot of progress with hepatitis C, there are still efforts that are going to need to be focused, especially on uh, younger individuals. If we are going to uh, reach the WHO um, uh, target for HCV elimination by the year 2030. Now switching to chronic hepatitis B, again, chronic hepatitis B is a chronic viral infection where we have lots of effective treatments that can alter the natural history of the disease. And you can see over the study period, there was a large increase in new cases of HPV related cirrhosis in most uh, birth cohorts up to the year 2010 followed by a relatively steep decline. So although we calculated that the rate was overall stable, that this changed over time. Now, the reason for this we hypothesize is that the approval of antivirals um, within Ontario, which are highly affected, occurred in approximately 2009. And these uh, antivirals have been shown to prevent disease progression. And so it coincides with a large rapid decline um, after the approvals of these medications. What I'll, what, the other thing that I find is interesting is that within the um, millennials, within the gray here, the line was relatively flat compared to all other birth cohorts where it went up and down. And this is just a reminder that the millennial birth cohort is the first birth cohort who would have been exposed to vaccinations for chronic hepatitis B at birth. And so this really suggests that this vaccination program has had a large impact on individuals uh, developing hepatitis B um, within Ontario. Projecting over the next 20 years, we would expect an ongoing decline in new cases of chronic hepatitis B, but you can also see that they're going to remain stable and they're not going to go down to zero. And therefore, although we have much better at treating hepatitis B and altering its natural history, given the burden of disease, there's going to be ongoing need for um, uh, therapy for hepatitis B uh, and potential transplantation. Finally, I won't spend too much time on this side. This is looking at autoimmune or other causes of cirrhosis. So these are causes of cirrhosis which aren't affected by uh, environmental type exposures. And there was a, overall a general decline in new cases over the study period, which were stable or declining for all birth cohorts. And over the next 20 years, it's expected that it will uh, 
again, decline or be relatively stable within all birth cohorts, which is what we would expect for uh, a disease which is not influenced by any uh, external factors. So looking at what we can expect by the year 2040, overall within Ontario, we expect that 75% of all new cases of cirrhosis are going to be secondary to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, followed by the next most common will be alcohol-related disease, hepatitis C will compromise approximately 6%, and hepatitis B and other uh, hereditary uh, conditions will be 2%. However, based on the information that we have, this is going to be differential based on when you were born. You can see that in older generations, NAFLD will predominate. And in younger generations, there's going to be a much larger contribution of alcohol-related disease uh, within that population. So finally, uh, switching gears a bit, it's important not only to recognize that uh, disease burden is increasing within the Ontario population, but also trying to understand which specific subgroups are more affected by one disease or another in order to try and target uh, education programs, screening, treatment, and access to transplantation. And therefore, an important group of individuals to evaluate are immigrants and refugees to Ontario. And that's because uh, chronic liver disease is um, a problem uh, worldwide and due to the large immigrant and refugee population to Canada and Ontario specifically it's important for us to understand what impact immigration is having on cirrhosis disease burden. So within these ICS databases that we use in order to look at this we are able to link to the Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada database which is called the IRCC and this database contains information on all immigrants and refugees who landed in Canada starting in the year 1985. This database provides information on country of birth, country of citizenship and residence, as well as mother tongue. And we have some preliminary data where we wanted to look specifically at this uh, population and look at um, the burden of chronic liver disease and cirrhosis from 2000 and 2017. And we group these individuals based on the country where they were born. So overall, we identified over 27,000 individuals who were either immigrants or refugees between that time period who had a diagnosis of cirrhosis. And what I've done here in this preliminary graph is I have broken down what the overall, what the cause of cirrhosis was, as well as where these individuals were born. So looking at overall causes of cirrhosis, the largest burden of uh, disease comes from individuals who were born in the Asia Pacific region. And most specifically looking at chronic hepatitis B, this is where the majority of individuals um, would be coming from. This is next followed by individuals from Europe uh, of approximately 20%, Africa and the Middle East at 13%, and uh, the Americas at 13%. But you can see that the region of birth varies based on the cause of underlying liver disease. And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to finish by looking specifically at the Asia Pacific region, given that it compromises the greatest burden of cirrhosis uh, within the immigrant population. So just a reminder to the audience uh, what geographically represents Asia Pacific. There's four regions I'm going to talk about specifically. So when I talk about East Asia, I'm talking about China, Hong Kong, Japan, North and South Korea, et cetera, um, within this region of Asia Pacific. When I talk about South Asia, this is going to be this region here, which comprises India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. When I talk about Southeast Asia, these countries would include Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, Malaysia, Vietnam, etc., within the uh, Southeast part of Asia. And finally, when we talk about the Middle East, this would include um, countries such as Egypt, Iran, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Israel, Turkey, etc. So in the next slide, what, uh, what we did is we took the 27,000 individuals who were diagnosed with cirrhosis 
And then we took each subregion and looked to see what the most common causes of liver disease were from these regions. So we classified it either NAFLD, hepatitis B, C, alcohol related disease, or autoimmune and other conditions. So looking at the top left here, East Asia, so this is again, China, Japan, North Korea, the majority of individuals with cirrhosis born in these areas have cirrhosis secondary to chronic hepatitis B, but you'll note the large proportion of individuals who also have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as this is becoming not only a North American, but a global epidemic. The contribution of hepatitis C, alcohol, and autoimmune conditions is much less in individuals who um, were born in East Asia. This is in uh, contrast to individuals from South Asia. So again, this is from the India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan um, region. The majority of individuals from South Asia diagnosed with cirrhosis actually have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and quite a substantial proportion also have alcohol rate related disease and hepatitis C. So you can see how these two graphs differ even though they're both populations are from the Asia Pacific region. Next, we looked at individuals uh, from Southeast Asia. Again, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the predominant cause, but there's also a significant proportion of individuals with chronic hepatitis B and chronic hepatitis C. Finally, looking at the Middle East, the majority of individuals uh, with cirrhosis have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, almost 80%. And this is very consistent with recent data coming from the Middle East, showing that uh, up to 40% of the entire population has underlying non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And there's about an even distribution of the other causes of chronic liver disease uh, within the Middle Eastern immigrant population in Ontario. Some of the limitations of this data, as I mentioned earlier, is that we're only able to capture individuals who immigrated after 1985. So anybody who landed in Canada prior to that is not going to be able to be identified uh, within these databases. Also, we are unable to identify second generation or higher groups of individuals uh, born to immigrant um, uh, parents. However, within ICES, there's also a surname definition that we are able to utilize, which can identify individuals from a Chinese or South Asian ethnic group. And additionally, there's the opportunity for us to link with the Canadian Organ Replacement Registry, which uh, contains information on all individuals weight listed and who had received liver transplantation. And we can gain some information on the ethnic background of these, these individuals as well. So this was a preliminary look at um, uh, cirrhosis disease burden within this population, but we still have a lot of work to do to really understand um, what uh, has led to uh, this and what we may expect in the future. So to summarize, the burden of cirrhosis has increased in Canada over the past two decades, driven mostly by hepatitis C and, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. However, by the year 2040, 75% of all new diagnoses of cirrhosis are anticipated to be secondary to NAFLD with the highest increases anticipated in menopausal females. There's some concerning trends that are seen for alcohol-related disease and chronic hepatitis C in younger birth cohorts, and this is expected to continue to contribute to cirrhosis disease burden to the year 2040. And therefore, as a community, if we're going to address chronic liver disease in Canada, this is, will require a multidisciplinary effort to prevent and manage not only non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but also alcohol-related disease and hepatitis C in younger generations. And finally, the causes of cirrhosis within immigrant and refugee populations varies considerably based on the region of birth, suggesting that targeted interventions for education or management may um, need to be developed based on country of birth. So I want to thank the audience for your attention and we will be taking questions um, later on in the session. I'm happy to uh, entertain any questions. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, thank you very much for uh, this uh, um, excellent review of the cause of liver disease uh, and burden of liver disease in Ontario in general, um, including uh, current uh, um, etiology of liver disease, as well as the projection over the next uh, few decades. I think that is uh, 
um, really eye-opening to to listen and hear about what uh, what is in front of us, um, especially as we are heading toward the um, the uh, burden of uh, fatty liver disease, which seems to be one of the major um, uh, head uh, or wave in front of us. Um, also, uh, the goal of this um, uh, seminar this morning is to uh, look and uh, study access to liver transplantation among the immigrant population and minorities. And I think that uh, your review of uh, what the burden of liver disease is Im among various uh, uh, communities and various immigrant population was um, quite uh, interesting. And uh, the differences among uh, what you um, exactly pointed as Asia, uh, various area of Asia is also um, uh, quite uh, uh, impressive. Thank you for this. And as you mentioned, we are gonna take all the questions at the very end. I encourage everybody to um, submit their question if they have uh, questions uh, through slido.com, uh, hashtag AM2. And, um, and uh, with uh, the setup of uh, presentation from Dr. F uh, Fleming, we can move on to our next uh, two speakers who are gonna speak more details about burden of liver disease in different communities. And uh, our next speaker is Dr. Natasha Chandak. Um, Dr. Chandak is a hepatologist uh, who is practicing at uh, William Osler Health System. She is a very good collaborator uh, that works very closely with us at the, um, at, uh, the transplant program. Uh, she is an adjunct professor uh, of medicine at the uh, University of Western Ontario and a clinical affiliate at the University of Manitoba. Most importantly, her collaboration with us uh, includes um, uh, not only referral of the patients who require liver transplantation from her community to, um, to us, but also uh, she uh, subsequently um, continue to follow these patients once they have received their transplant and uh, um, take care of them for a longer uh, period. Um, Natasha, without further ado, we are uh, looking forward to hear from you uh, on the burden of end-stage liver disease in the South Asian population uh, in Brampton, uh, Ontario. Thank you and good morning. Um, I thank the audience for tuning in this morning and the wonderful introduction by Nazia. So um, uh, I will begin my presentation. Um, so just to begin with, I just want to emphasize the geocultural diversity of South Asians living in Canada. Um, as Dr. Fleming mentioned, South Asia refers to the region that's noted on this map. And we can appreciate, for example, in India, there's a population of 1.366 billion individuals. Pakistan is also a very highly populated country with 205 million individuals. We also have other nations in South Asia, including Nepal, Bangladesh, and not shown on this map of Sri Lanka, which has a population of just under 30 million. When we imagine um, studying South Asians, we need to bear in mind that there's a tremendous amount of diversity within this region. So for example, if you look at India as a nation, we can see a lot of variation in types of cuisine that uh, uh, citizens would consume. It varies quite significantly from Northern India down to Southern India. There is a lot of variation in terms of languages spoken, religions practiced and so forth. So when we're trying to study a very diverse community uh, who has now immigrated into Canada, we do need to be sensitive to the tremendous diversity within this group. Um, as you know, over the course of the last few decades, Canada has developed an increasingly higher proportion of visible minorities. In 1981, we only had less than 5% visible minorities. And as the decades have 
um, gone on. Um, we're projected to have um, a portion as high as 35% by the year 2036. Um, presently, um, the total population of Canada is comprised of 3% of the population as coming from South Asia. When we look at Ontario, we can look at in further detail, the breakdown of visible minorities within our province. And we can see that South Asians represent approximately 30% of the population or the largest proportion of visible minorities. I also wanna point out that the South Asian community is among the fastest growing community of visible minorities. I now wanna to talk to you about the city of Brampton, Ontario. And Brampton, as you'll soon learn, is an ideal population to study when we're trying to understand health issues that South Asian Canadians face. The city of Brampton has a population of 600,000 individuals. Brampton is Canada's ninth largest city and it's the fourth largest city within Ontario. The growth of Brampton has been extremely rapid over the last five years. In fact, it's grown at twice the rate of the rest of the province in terms of population and it is the second fastest growing city in Canada. The other unique aspect of the demographics of Brampton is it is actually the nation's youngest population with an average age of citizens at below age 35. Brampton also enjoys um, tremendous cultural diversity. There are 89 languages spoken within the city and citizens come from 209 different cultures. When we look at the uh, percentage of visible minorities in Brampton, it's substantially higher than that of Canada as a whole. 66.4% of residents of Brampton are visible minorities. And when we look at this visible minority population within the city, we can appreciate that South Asians are almost 60% of the visible minorities, followed by um, Black Canadians and Chinese Canadians. There is, um, in addition to um, a lot of diversity of uh, citizens with respect to country of origin, we do see some religious um, affiliation variation as well. Now we need to bear in mind that on survey data like census data, there is a lot of, um, a lot of citizens who don't necessarily answer this question of, of, of religious affiliation, but approximately 56% uh, of residents are Christian. And, the um, city does have just under 10% of residents who identify as practicing Sikhism, Islam, or Hinduism. The latter three faiths, of course, very common in the South Asian population. It is important for us to understand the religious faith of our patients, because as you can imagine, this has a tremendous bearing on how patients perceive health, how they may um, uh, make healthcare decisions. When we look at the languages in Brampton, there is certainly a great diversity. Um, most uh, citizens of the city do indicate that English is their first language. But that being said, the mother tongue language is um, different than one's first language. So 251,000 residents have a non-English mother tongue language. And you can see that the Punjabi language is spoken as a mother tongue in almost one in six residents. And um, this is followed by Gujarati, uh, Urdu and Hindi. And um, just for the audience that may not be familiar with these languages, if you're able to converse in Punjabi, you're usually able to converse in Urdu and Hindi to patients, but Gujarati and some of the other South Indian languages are phonetically very diff different. So it's very hard to communicate with uh, those patients um, uh, unless you of course speak that particular language. Um, it is my experience as the only hepatologist at Brampton Civic Hospital, that the majority of my South Asian patients, um, especially if they are older than the fifth decade of life, strongly prefer communicating in their mother tongue language. And it's also my perception that issues around connecting patients of South Asian origin to transplantation um, do need to involve for us to improve access um, 
better uh, ability for us to translate for patients. I think that language is a barrier that we can hopefully um, work toward um, uh, rectifying. Um, and thankfully, um, both uh, Toronto and our hospital um, do have translation services, but it can be intimidating for a patient who doesn't feel comfortable in English to speak about such personal issues as their health and even to try to broach the subject of transplantation. Um, I now want to talk a little bit about the health status of residents in Peel. And I'd like to remind you of what Peel Region is. Peel Region is comprised of three cities, Brampton, Mississauga, and Caledon. And just to remind you, um, Caledon, um, in case you're not familiar with it, is a much different city than Brampton in terms of eth ethnic uh, breakdown. So in some sense, um, Caledon may be more similar to a city such as London, Ontario. Residents in Caledon are primarily Caucasian and would come originally from uh, Europe or are multi-generational Canadians. And this is in contrast to what I've told you about Brampton. The demography of Mississauga is very similar to the demography in the city of Toronto. So approximately 50% of residents of Mississauga are Caucasian. When we lump Peel as a region and combine these three cities, we are getting a slightly different demographic background than we would if we just look at Brampton. And there would certainly be less South Asians in Peel region in terms of proportion as opposed to simply looking at Brampton. So I just wanted to highlight that point for you because I am talking a little bit about the region of Peel health status report. Um, there is a perception on the ground in Brampton where I work that our hospital is overutilized. And it turns out that that's not the case. Um, residents of Peel region are hospitalized actually at a similar rate to the rest of the province. And we also have a similar portion of residents who are so-called high resource utilizers than the rest of the province. Interestingly, one's um, immigration status is linked to how many healthcare resources one tends to use. So we know that long-term immigrants are more likely to be high risk, or sorry, high resource users rather than recent immigrants or non-immigrants. I do wanna mention that South Asians have unique health issues that we do need to understand further. Um, the reality is that we don't have robust epidemiological data yet on the true prevalence of liver diseases in South Asian residents. And I'm very excited about the wonderful research that Dr. Fleming presented earlier this morning on that topic. We certainly need to expand that research and develop it further. We do know from the research that South Asian um, Canadians do have higher rates of metabolic disease. They have more obesity. They have higher prevalence of viral hepatitis. There is also a high usage of alcohol and unfortunately alcohol misuse disorder, which is prevalent in the Punjabi community. Interestingly, in studies that I have read on this topic, it doesn't appear that um, South Asians living in Canada necessarily have more um, alcohol misuse than Europeans, but I think this is an area that we do need to study further. It is my perception in managing patients from the South Asian community that even though alcohol misuse disorder may not necessarily be more prevalent, what does appear more prevalent to me is alcohol-related liver disease. And there may be genetic reasons for that. There may be other co-factors of chronic liver disease that are making our South Asian patients more vulnerable to alcohol-related liver disease, including the presence of metabolic syndrome. Um, this slide summarizes for you South Asian Canadians' um, risk factors for various liver diseases. The first point I want to make is that because South Asians are born in nations which have higher prevalences of viral hepatitis, it's not surprising that they would be at greater risk to have chronic hepatitis B and C. And often screening was not done in their native country as you may know, when patients immigrate to Canada, they are screened for hepatitis B, but unfortunately they're not screened for hepatitis C. And we're currently working with our primary care providers in this 
city to try to improve screening for viral hepatitis C. Um, I want to reference to you a wonderful article out of researchers at McMaster, which looked at 5.8 million individuals through a systematic review and meta-analysis of 50 different studies looking at South Asians living in Canada. And what they found is that South Asians in Canada have much more higher prevalences of many diseases as opposed to Caucasian Canadians. These include more than a twofold risk of having diabetes, a 10% higher chance of having hypertension. South Asian Canadians also have lower HDL cholesterol, which is our good cholesterol. We also have noted in the research that male South Asians have 3% or more higher percentage of body fat and females 4.1% higher percentage of body fat. Research has also indicated that South Asians in Canada are more sedentary and consume diets higher in refined carbohydrates as compared with Caucasian patients in Canada. Now you may be wondering, why am I talking to you about metabolic syndrome today when we're focused on liver disease? And the reason for that is each and every risk factor that I've mentioned to you of metabolic syndrome is a risk factor for liver cancer, is a risk factor for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which Dr. Fleming has, has indicated to us is the number one chronic liver disease in our nation. So I want to, want to now try to begin to summarize for you the burden of liver disease that we see in South Asian Canadians. I mentioned to you this slide, which I think is extremely important. This slide tells us the leading causes of potential years of life loss. And in terms of statistics, this is my favorite statistic to go to when I'm trying to explain to patients or other healthcare providers the importance that we focus on chronic liver disease in our society. Um, instead of just looking at mortality, what potential years of life loss statistic looks at is the, the life that an individual patient should have lived but cannot. So for example, if we have a patient with liver cirrhosis who passes away at age 40, she has lost many potential decades that she should have lived. And in some sense, that statistic also gives us an indication of the loss to society that that um, death has held. Not to say that a death in a 95 year old from a myocardial infarction is not as important an event, but we can just appreciate the, the greater burden that a younger death may have from a chronic liver disease. So with that in mind, we see cirrhosis as the seventh most leading cause of potential years of life loss. And I think that gives us an understanding of the importance of this disease in Peel region and indeed across the country. So what do we know about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in South Asia? Dr. Fleming has indicated to us that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the number one cause of cirrhosis and unfortunately will continue to um, become an increasing um, uh, burden in terms of end-stage liver disease as our population ages. We are obviously in a mad rush to find therapeutic options for patients before they get cirrhotic. But unfortunately at this time, there's no therapeutic um, drugs on the market that can actually reverse this disease and certainly not to reverse cirrhosis. In South Asia, we do understand from prevalence data there that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is extremely common and may in fact be much more common than it is in North American um, studies. So North American studies such as that of N. Haynes generally said that the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is in the order of 20, 25%. When we look at studies out of South Asia, however, the prevalence data is much higher, um, often over 50%, depending on what study you're reading. So we can imagine a scenario when we have immigrants that are coming from this region and now establishing themselves in Canada, we are dealing with a very important health issue that we need to identify in this community. What about viral hepatitis? So I've mentioned to you that viral hepatitis prevalence is certainly higher in South Asia than it is in Canada. And as such, we can um, correctly infer that our immigrants from South Asia are having more uh, rates of hepatitis B and C. 
Unfortunately, ethnicity data is not collected by public health. So I cannot share with you this morning the actual prevalence of hepatitis B and C in the South Asian population. Overall in Canada, um, estimates have been, uh, for example, for hepatitis C, that 0.5 to 0.8 of the population has this virus. Recent important studies by researchers both in the United States and Canada have taught us that baby boomers have a threefold higher prevalence of hepatitis C um, as compared with the general population. And an individual I spoke to at Peel Public Health has told me that that's roughly a similar rate that we're seeing in South Asian residents in Peel. So we really need to ramp up our screening in the region because if we can cure and prevent and stage liver disease in this group of patients, hopefully we can reduce the need for tr transplantation in some individuals. So I now wanna to talk to you about the burden of advanced liver disease for patients needing hospitalization in the city of Brampton among South Asian patients. Um, I'd just like to um, let you know that Brampton Civic Hospital is the hospital uh, from whom I've obtained data. And the hospital is the only admitting hospital within the city. So we can thus infer that most residents in Brampton who require hospitalization for end stage liver disease would generally come to our hospital. Um, we obtained data from the discharge abstract database of our hospital, as well as our electronic um, database, which is called Meditech. And what we did was we looked at discharges between January 2015 and December 2019 with a diagnostic code of cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease. We recognized that alcoholic liver disease is very common in this population. So we decided to stratify patients by alcoholic liver disease as compared with non-alcoholic liver diseases. We did um, take basic demographic data but unfortunately, data on ethnicity to understand the origin of where patients come from was not available in our database. This graph shows you the number of admissions to our hospital for end-stage liver disease. And there are roughly 400 admissions a year at Brampton Civic Hospital for end-stage liver disease. This bar has a blue and red bar. The blue bar is um, patients who had a primary diagnosis of cirrhosis and the red bar as a secondary diagnosis of cirrhosis. I don't want you to get too hung up on primary versus secondary. Often when patients are being admitted for cirrhosis, they will have a precipitating event. This may be sepsis, it may be renal failure or a GI bleed. And the important thing that we want to capture is the diagnosis of cirrhosis. I also want to emphasize for you again that I can't tell you this morning how many patients on these bars are actually South Asians. However, if we go back to the statistics, if approximately 50% of the total population of Brampton is South Asian, um, it's my experience as a hepatologist that more than 50% of the patients I'm seeing for cirrhosis diagnosis in the hospital are South Asians. So it's my belief that South Asians are overrepresented, but of course we need solid data to prove that observation. But you can like easily infer that when I'm talking about these numbers, approximately half are South Asians, and that would be similar to the portion of the population in the city. Um, this slide shows you um, admissions to hospital as broken down by a diagnosis of alcoholic liver disease in blue versus non-alcoholic liver diseases, of which there are, of course, many, such as hepatitis B, hepatitis C, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and so forth. And what you can see is approximately 30% of these admissions are for alcohol-related liver disease. When I see that statistic, I'm very motivated to do everything I can as a health provider in the community to try to help patients with alcohol misuse disorder. So we try to partner with our colleagues in mental health because clearly some of these admissions we can prevent. And that's, I think, a major um, challenge that we have in the city of Brampton. 
This um, slide shows you the length of hospitalization for liver disease. And these numbers are absolutely astounding to me. So patients are staying in hospital about 14 days. That is a lot of healthcare resource utilization, not to mention a lot of costs to our public healthcare system. On average, a day in the hospital is over $1,000 and we're now, of course, unfortunately, looking at a second wave of COVID and anything we can do to be um, utilizing our healthcare resources in uh, a better way is obviously our objective as a healthcare community. Um, and this just gives you a sense also of how tremendously sick patients with end-stage liver disease are to need a 14-day hospitalization. This slide is also very alarming to me as a clinician. Um, this slide is showing us how many patients who are admitted for cirrhosis need the intensive care unit. And you can see roughly 25% of patients need the ICU. And there are very few diseases I can think of that take up as many resources as end-stage liver disease. Um, in the ICU bed in Ontario, it costs roughly $2,000 a day. And when I speak to our health administrators on the ground in Brampton, they tell me that patients with end-stage liver disease typically need much more resources than the average ICU patient. The reason for this, often they have multi-organ failure when they are in the ICU. They're typically intubated, mechanically ventilated, sometimes needing dialysis, often needing inotropic support and sometimes needing urgent endoscopic treatments and so forth. So you can imagine um, the, the amount of resources this disease is consuming. This graph is showing you the number of hours that patients are staying in the ICU. And this again is mind boggling numbers to me. So patients are staying in hospital with cirrhosis eight or nine days. That just gives you, again, a sense of how tremendously sick patients are. And I didn't show you mortality data and other data, which I hope to extract in the future. But um, just to highlight um, the tremendous um, resource burden that this disease plays. So I now want to switch gears a little bit and start to begin to talk about some transplant issues as it pertains to South Asian Canadians. So as you know from the, the research and what Dr. Fleming, of course, has indicated to us as well in the beginning of this presentation, South Asians have a high and rapidly growing incidence of chronic liver disease. Despite this, and despite the fact that in Asia, there are some very stellar live donor programs, the contribution that South Asians have to both deceased donation as well as live donation is actually relatively small. And this is a very important research question that we need to explore further in terms of why is this um, contribution small? What do we need to do to expand the donor pool so that our South Asian patients have greater access to transplantation? So I now wanna to talk to you about whatever data that we do have. And the reality is that we desperately need data and we don't have robust data in South Asians. And thankfully some of our researchers on this panel will be working toward answering this question. Based on United Kingdom data, it does appear that South Asians in that nation do have comparable access to Denise, deceased donation with comparable outcomes to white citizens, but we, don't have, as I said, robust data on live donation. This study is looking at the SRTR database, which is a US-based database on uh, organ recipients uh, for liver transplantation. And this is an interesting um, study. I just want to um, explain to you what we're looking at so that the slide makes a little bit more sense to you. So you'll see four bars next to each ethnic group. And as the bars get lighter in color, these are patients who are sicker. When we allocate organs, we use something called the MELD score, which stands for the model for end-stage liver disease. And in Ontario, the average MELD score for transplantation is probably in the mid twenties, just to give you some reference. What you can see is that in the very sickest of groups, so patients with MELD scores between 30 and 40 in the United States, we're seeing that Asian patients 
have 46% less liver transplantations than the same patient who is Caucasian. So this is a major discrepancy that we do need to understand further. Now, unfortunately, in this type of a database that was used, we don't know the breakdown of these Asian patients. We don't know how many come from Southeast Asia versus South Asia and so forth. But clearly there's a discrepancy that we do need to research and explore further in deceased donation. What about live liver donation? This study that I'm going to talk to you briefly about is looking at data from the United Network for Organ Sharing, which is the federally funded group that monitors transplantation activity in the United States. And what this research group found is that there are significant um, uh, discrepancies in terms of access to transplant in those who belong to a racial minority group. So patients who are ethnic minorities are receiving disproportionately low percentage of live livers. And when the researchers looked into why this is occurring, the main reason they identified is that there is less interest by potential donors. And this underscores a need for us in the healthcare community and in the research community to really understand why this discrepancy is occurring. We need to provide more education and be more effective at providing outreach to potential donors of minority backgrounds so that we can increase the potential donor pool for these patients. And interestingly, this trend is something that has also been demonstrated in kidney donation. So there's something going on that we don't yet understand. Is it a financial issue? Is it um, a fear issue? What is the issue that's preventing patients who are South Asian from obtaining potential donors? Obviously, we do lack specific data on South Asians and hopefully we'll work toward acquiring that through upcoming studies. I leave you with three or four closing remarks for my portion of, of this talk. Um, so first of all, we know that transplant recipients are a highly selected population. And I cannot emphasize enough the joy that I get as a hepatologist to receive patients back from Toronto General Hospital who have a new life, who have many more years to live, who have an excellent quality of life thanks to transplantation. And it should be noted that research has clearly demonstrated to us that South Asians have the same benefits to transplantation as all other ethnic groups, including white patients. And therefore we need to do everything we can to bring this therapy to this group. We know that South Asians have a high burden of cirrhosis and a high theoretical need for transplantation but I do emphasize the need for more robust data and I look forward to Dr. Fleming's work in this area. We also desperately need to understand the barriers that South Asians face in Canada on getting onto a transplant wait list, particularly for liver as we talk about this morning, including live liver donation. Specifically, we need to explore every possible barrier and try to find solutions. This might be a transportation barrier. It might be a language barrier. It might be a financial barrier, of patients not being able to take time off of work. It might also be a cultural issue. Older patients may through uh, cultural um, uh, practices feel awkward in actually reaching out to their family members asking for this type of gift. So those are um, areas that uh, we look forward to exploring. And I thank you for your time this morning. Um, Natasha, thank you so very much for this uh, uh, very detailed analysis of uh, uh, the South Asian community in <clears throat> Brampton, the very eye-opening complexity already within this uh, community in terms of languages, the various cultures, and uh, also walking us through the, the complexity of liver disease and their access to liver transplantation. Um, I think that uh, your analysis in terms of barrier to liver transplant are extremely important and certainly uh, very, um, uh, very important for us to know as we are embarking in this, uh, in this new uh, path to try to increase access to liver transplantation for our diverse minority. 
and all your points in terms of language barrier, cultural barrier, uh, financial barrier, and um, even some logistic barriers uh, such as transportation and um, uh, you know bringing them to hospital, etc., are extremely valuable for for us to um, study and try to. Um, uh, help um, resolving them uh, so that this community have better access to liver transplantation, but also uh, to live donor liver transplantation. Thank you very much again for, for this analysis. Um, I think our next speaker uh, is, um, uh, is um, um, Kalina Yin. She is our um, uh, nurse practitioner at the Toronto Center for Liver Disease for probably over to three decades already. Um, I am sure that everybody who is listening this morning and has been to the Toronto Center for Liver Disease has uh, met Kalina. She is a, a, a long-standing uh, figure in this um, in this center and. Uh, works very, very closely with the um, uh, Chinese community particularly. Uh, and she is gonna walk us through the burden of uh, liver disease in Chinese community and the perspective from the Toronto Center for Liver Disease in terms of access to transplantation. Uh, Colina, thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Sausna. And I want to thank the organizer really to give me this opportunity to talk about liver disease in Chinese community. Now, there really um, an awful lot of research or studies or reports about liver disease in Chinese Canadians. So what my presentation today would largely from my experience working with a lot of Chinese patients over my 30 years of nursing career. So um, for the next 15, 20 minutes or so, I will first share with you some statistics from our center on liver disease among Chinese Canadians. And I'll tell you what is the leading cause of liver disease in Chinese population and what are the barriers to accessing liver care including liver transplantation and live organ donations. And last but not least is something very dear to my heart is about the Chinese hepatitis B peer support group that I helped initiate about 10 years ago. So let's look at the ethnic diversity who come to our center, like the liver clinic. So as of last Friday, September 11th, so we have a total number of a little over 13,000 patients registered in our electronic database. And out of that number, as you can see here, about 2,100 are Chinese. And these Chinese patients, they're mostly immigrants from either mainland China or Hong Kong. Now, I must um, clarify that these numbers are no means represent all the patients that we see in the clinic is because we have two Chinese speaking hepatologists and the patient data have not yet merged into the electronic database. So my best estimate of number of Chinese patients to throw through our clinic, I would estimate around three and a half thousand. But let's just focus on these 2,100 patients that are registered in our database. So what is the most common liver disease that we're seeing in our Chinese patients? So you can see in the diagram here, more than 75% of Chinese patients who come to our clinic because of hepatitis B. And when they have hepatitis B, we also have this number of patients have cirrhosis. So really about one out of four patients with hepatitis B, they have cirrhosis. And we also have over 100 patients have liver cancer. So that's roughly about 1.8% of our patients have. So I sort of always tease my patients, joke around with that. Well, remember B is bad. So when you have hepatitis B, it can give you cirrhosis. And once you have cirrhosis, you are at high risk of liver cancer. 
So what is hepatitis B? Just a few words so for people to be familiar with this virus. So hepatitis B is a virus infection that affects the liver. It is a totally different virus from the other viruses such as hepatitis A or hepatitis C. However, similar to hepatitis C, hepatitis B is also a bloodborne virus. What I mean by that is the virus is carried in the blood. So in order for me to become infected with this virus, someone who's been infected with the virus have to um, like get blood, it contaminated blood has to get into my blood before I can get infected. So it's really a close blood to blood contact. In Canada, the most common route of transmission of hepatitis B is from sex. In fact, here, hepatitis B is considered as a sexually transmitted disease. But in Asian countries where hepatitis B is highly endemic, the most common route of transmission is from mother to child. And how does that happen? Is mostly during the delivery process. When during the delivery, there is a very high risk of blood transfer from mother to baby. And that is the time when the transfer of the transmission occurs. And when the baby had hepatitis B, the immune system is not mature. So it ends up that the child will carry this virus for a long time in their life. And hepatitis B does not give you symptoms unless until the liver is severely damaged. And if someone has active hepatitis B and left untreated, about one in four will develop cirrhosis. And once the, uh, cirrhosis is developed, about the risk of developing liver cancer is about one in 20 per year. And that is not an insignificant number. As we all know, we do have very effective hepatitis B vaccine available. And there are also effective antiviral treatments available, like you know, almost for two decades. But the question remains is, why are we still seeing patients, like, like especially Chinese um, Canadians, have increasing number of cirrhosis and liver cancer? Is it because they're unaware of the disease, because they're not seeking care, or they're not receiving treatment? I think that's probably all of these above. So over the, all my years, I'm talking to Chinese patients with hepatitis B. These are the most common misconceptions that I got asked and I heard from my patients. First one is I'm a hepatitis B carrier. I have no disease. So carrier is really a bad word. It's a misleading word in a way. It's because when people think, well, I'm just carrying the virus. I, you know, it's just in my body. It's not doing anything. So I'm fine. But as long as you have the virus in the body, there is always a chance of activation. There's a chance of active disease. So nowadays we teach our patients, uh, we're avoiding to use the word carrier. Instead, we'll tell our patients whether your hepatitis B is active or not active. And the misconception is I have no symptoms. I do not need to see a doctor. Again, that is wrong because hepatitis B does not give you symptoms until the liver is severely scarred. Again, I have no symptoms, so my hepatitis B is not serious. And again, that is wrong because even in early cirrhosis, as Dr. Fleming has talked about in earlier section, that early cirrhosis also does not give you some symptoms. Hepatitis B can be transmitted by sharing food. Again, that is wrong. It's mainly transmitted from blood. I have liver cancer, I'm going to die. Well, yeah, you're going to die if we find the cancer when the cancer is as big as your liver, or the cancer has already spread to the rest of your body. So the main thing is we have to, but we have to find a cancer when the cancer is small. And there are treatment options nowadays for liver cancer, including liver transplant. So really early treatment for patients with active hepatitis B is really key to prevent the disease from getting worse. In fact, patients with cirrhosis because of hepatitis B, cirrhosis can regress. Now I put here can be reversed. It may not be appropriate word because it's more a regression of the scar tissue. So if you are taking long-term antiviral treatment, the liver, the cirrhotic liver can go back, like, you know, have less scars become softer. 
And so nowadays, people with hepatitis B, with cirrhosis, they're not going to die of hepatitis B if they start treatment early, if they continue to adhere to the long-term antiviral treatment. But the problem is because when you have a cirrhosis, you're also at a higher risk of liver cancer. Now, long-term antiviral treatment can lower the liver cancer risk, but unfortunately cannot totally prevent it. So liver cancer is now the leading cause for transplant among Chinese Canadians nowadays. And we need to realize that liver transplant can save life. An interesting point is Dr. Um, Chandok that talked about the transplant concept in Southeast Asia. It's also the same, it's very similar among Chinese Canadians, is that like I do have Chinese patients who receive transplant because of liver cancer, but I have not had one Chinese patient who receive life liver donors and it is uncommon in Chinese patients. So next I want to point you out to this studies that we have done from our center and it was published in 2009. What we did is we surveyed about over 200 hepatitis B patients, like Chinese patients, and we gave them a questionnaire. Is this mostly a knowledge-based questionnaire? Because we want to find out how much knowledge that our hepatitis B patients have and what are the barriers that prevent them from undergoing screening or monitoring or treatment of their hepatitis B? So these are the main, the highlights of what we learned from our studies. So out of the seven barriers that we listed for our patients, the top three barriers that our patients reported that prevent them from accessing care is time, inconvenience, and language. And the major, major misconceptions that I gather from our patient is that severe liver disease is always symptomatic. In other words, when I have no symptoms, I have no severe disease. And I think that also speak to why they think time is a barrier because, well, if I don't think I have disease, then why I spend the time in coming to, to see you to the clinic when I can do something else? So in terms of knowledge gaps, is we only have a little over half of our patients cohort know what cirrhosis means. About 63% know about antiviral treatment, despite the fact that back in 2009, they are very effective antiviral treatment already. And social stigma. Two out of three, the patients believe that they were stigmatized by hepatitis B. And about one out of three, they were ashamed of the hepatitis B. And because of this, they feel ashamed. They don't want to discuss hepatitis B with their family or friends. And it is not unusual. And I've seen it in many of my patients. And they will say, well, when you call me, don't tell me, don't tell, don't leave messages on my phone because I don't want my family to know about my hepatitis B. So those are the, 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 what we learned from the study. But from my personal experience working with Chinese patients with hepatitis B, and I think these are more barriers. There are more barriers for them to access care and treatment. So along the line, same line about knowledge, I think there's also a lack of awareness about their risk of getting hepatitis B. Um, I have patients who are born in Canada and they said, well, I'm totally shocked when they find me, I have hepatitis B because I'm born in Canada. But their parents came from high endemic areas. So when the parents came from China, from Hong Kong, they remain at risk of having hepatitis B. Remember, I said that it's the from mother to child transmission. There's also a lack of awareness about healthcare system in Canada. I have patients tell me that, well, I don't bother to come back to see you because I cannot afford to pay the medication. I don't have a drug plan and I, I'm a middle class and I, like, I don't have the money to pay for the antiviral. Back in 2009 or 10, the antiviral is very expensive. It's like you can cost up to like eight and a half thousand dollars a year. And that is a lot of money to many immigrants. And there's a barrier about mistrust of healthcare system. So I, from time to time, I have patients who are diagnosed with liver cancer and they decided they don't believe that they would be seen early. They are unsure how soon I will get treatment. 
they are not sure that they will be treated equally that to have their liver cancer looked after. So patients, once they have the, the diagnosis of liver cancer, they just return back to the home country, to mainland China, to Hong Kong and get treatment instead. And I cannot talk about barriers without talking about the cultural belief and values. So each culture has their own beliefs and values. In Chinese, like as a Chinese myself, I know that's family values. So I know some families, they actually absolutely, like they don't want any discussion on death related topics. So definitely death and dying are not on the like family dinner table for discussion. And I also know families, in fact, I also have patients tell me that, well, don't tell my family members that they're dying. Don't tell them about the illness. What the belief is, is that if you tell that person, that sick person that they're dying or they have really bad disease, then they will get sicker. You'll just hasten the death. That they, they, they will make you will make them depressed. You will make them like you know feel bad, and they will not have what they call a good death. And that is some of the family beliefs. And there's also this culture um, that they believe Western medicine can upset the body's yin and yang balance. So yin and yang is really the fundamental philosophy of life in Chinese culture. And so they, the, the yin and yang are really opposing force and they, you must be a balance in order to have harmony in life. So a lot of Chinese patients, they say, well, let me try, you know, this Chinese herbal medicine like for my hepatitis B before I try Western medicine. So that is their beliefs. Again, trust. There are people who trust only credible professionals and like, you know, it's, it depends on how reputable that the organization is. And they also believe that organ donation is a body destroying behavior. So what are some potential strategies to overcome these barriers? So of course, education will come on top of the list. Again, educate, educate, educate. I think that we cannot do like this is so important, but I also think how we deliver education is also important. It, of course, it will be like excellent if we can, if the educator or the um, healthcare providers can speak the language of um, the, our patients that we, we, we look after, but it's not possible. Now, I want to give you an a, a example that we have a group of very dedicated Chinese family doctors from Chinatown, and they have organized this specifically for the Chinese community, they have the health awareness event every year. They was held in Scarborough and it's all delivered in Chinese language. And every year they managed to attract 800 to 1000 Chinese um, Canadians to attend these events. And then during the event, that is where they learn about their, their health, about um, hepatitis B. So the second strategies I put is about communication and that of course include the language barrier. And some of the strategies that we, we can think about multilingual clinics and use of interpreters and at University of Health Network, we are very fortunate. We do have a language um, line that in that when we need interpreters, we can just call up the number and then we have simultaneous interpretation right away. Now, what I observed though is for um, as a language barrier. In fact, I would say many of the Chinese Canadians, they actually are pretty fluent in English. They can understand. Um, of course, there's still minority that they do not speak a word of English, but majority they do, they understand. But what I hear from my patient is that, well, I'm afraid that I do not understand the medical terms is sometimes I cannot, I don't know how to express myself. I don't know how to describe my symptoms. So these are the fear. So these are why they prefer education to be conducted in the mother town. The third strategy I would say is about convenience, extend the clinic hours maybe. I don't know how feasible it is, but that is another strategy that we can think about. And of course we need more studies to understand the cultural inference in um, Chinese patients' behavior. And last but not least, I'm going to talk about patient support groups as a way to overcome these barriers. So this is 
um, the Chinese hepatitis B peer support group that I initiated back in 2010. I must tell you the story. What is the impetus that drives me to initiate this support group? I have this um, woman patients with hepatitis B and during a regular clinic appointment and then she asked me, well, Kalina, what type of hepatitis do I have? Do I have a hepatitis B or do I have hepatitis C? So that is sort of like come to my mind, oh my God, like I have looked after her for over 10 years and she is asking me that question. So I have done such a terrible job in educating my patients. So I've seen her all the time. I guess the assumption is, well, this patient has been a long-term patient, so they must understand everything. And that is wrong. So yes, every time when we have an interview in the clinic, that that's only 10, 15 minutes. I mean, the patients have so many questions that may, we might not have the time to answer the question. So that is the time when I said, well, that is something that I have to do something. So I started the conversation with a number of my Chinese hepatitis B patients and the enthusiasm that I received was, was astounding. So that is how I started this group and, and who they are and they are just patients and patients and families. So on the picture you see, this is what I call the core working group of the, um, of the, of the, the whole group. And they are patients and they are patients families and they are two uh, couples here on the pictures. So they're very dedicated and the aim of the support group is to, as I say, to provide support to patients with hepatitis B, to give them information, to give information from experts, from us, like, you know, we, we are the experts in hepatitis B. And also, we also find that why they want to come is because they want to share information. They want to share the stories. So I'm going to show you the kind of activities that we have done so far. And we have been holding education seminars at least six times a year. And during the seminar, like the patients, they share the stories, they share like um, the experience of the hepatitis B. And we also do a lot of outreach events. And it was last year, 2019, the peer support group, they were, we were in Chinatown, particip participate in the Chinatown um, event. And we are there and have a booth, we support and we promote hepatitis B awareness. And here again, it was last year, we participated in one of the health event, we promote hepatitis B screening. And we also have newsletters that we send out to our patients in, in the clinic, and we also send it to in a community. And one of our hepatitis B volunteers is a Tai Chi master. So we have Tai Chi classes and teach our hepatitis B patients about exercise and so forth. So right now we have a support phone line for our hepatitis B patients. We have an email address. We recently have also developed a website. So all this work was done by our hepatitis B patients totally volunteering their work and their time in supporting this group. So I also want to talk about the point of care testing project that um, the support group has done in the past couple of years. So what is a point of care testing? So usually remember, if we want to find out whether we have hepatitis B, we need to go to our um, family doctor, have a blood test done, and then we'll send to the lab and find out, right? But this is a point of care. So meaning that it's just a finger prick and just one drop of blood from your finger and then we put it on a slide and we will have the result in about 20 minutes. So that will, in 20 minutes, we can tell someone whether you have, you have the hepatitis B or not. So we have this project, we're very um, happy and then we decided, well, let's target the high traffic Chinese shopping malls. So the first two event, we went to the first Markham place in Markham and we went to the Chinatown Center on Spadina. And really to our disappointment, we have low uptake rate. We did not have like tons of people coming to us. And we, we, we sort of afterwards, we debriefed and why is that? Like, you know, we have less than 50 people come to our booth after we spend a whole day standing, like have a booth in the mall. And I think, and then we realized that, look at this huge banner we have. It says hepatitis B screening. So we find out that, that people, the Chinese 
Canadians, they don't want to come to us in a public place because they won't, they don't want to be seen by their friends or whoever that, well, I, because I might have hepatitis B. So that is speak to us about the social stigma. So we learned the lesson. So we changed our strategy after these two first two event. And since then, we only go to smaller community centers. We go to health um, events and we have much better result. And that is the lesson we learned. So um, next I want just to tell a quick um, member story. So let's call her Anna. Anna attended one of our um, support group at which event in the community. And then she find out, you know, what we've done. So why is she interested? She's interested because her husband was recently diagnosed with hepatitis B and also unfortunately inoperable liver cancer. And that's why she so happy to find us. And she came to our meeting and during the meeting, she's able to talk about her husband's illness and she's able to talk about her burden and experience as a caregiver. And she afterwards told us, oh, it's such a relief that I can talk about my experience, talk about my husband's illness. So her husband died a few months later, but she continued to become part of our member. And I think that is what support group is about to give them support, to help people to talk about their experience. And the question remained in her mind is, could her husband's death outcome be reversed? Will hepatitis B identified and treated early? And would transplant be an option? So I don't, I cannot say that yes, for sure, but I think there's always a possibility if the husband knew about hepatitis B earlier and treated earlier. So the question, um, well, this is all about transplant. So I was thinking about is organ donation in Chinese culture that I don't think I can answer that question. So I dig into some literature and I try to understand about organ donation in Chinese Canadians. And there is really nothing much that I can find, but I find something is about China. So people, as I said before, we have a lot of Chinese immigrated from mainland China. So back in China, historically, organ transplant, they use organs from executed prisoners. Well, is it ethical? Well, it is ethical, like that's, this culture is generally accepted because the way that people see it is for the criminals, it's a payback for the crimes that they have committed. It's sort of like, you know, an eye for an eye, so to speak. So not until 2014 in China, there is a national voluntary organ donation system established. So organ donation is, uh, is, is still, this concept is fairly new for people who live in China. And in 2019, there was an American study that was published. They looked at what are the barriers to organ donation among Chinese and Koreans in North America. And they listed the four top barriers to organ donation. The first one is lack of knowledge, because if they don't know about organ donation, they will not do it. And there's a distrust of healthcare and distrust of allocation system. And there is this value about the desire for intact body after death. And again, also is the family values about the meaning of that. So that is in North America, like among Chinese and Korea. So what is the attitude like in Chinese Canadians? What are the attitude like towards living organ donation? And how willing are we as Chinese Canadians to be a life donor? Um, we don't know. And that's why we need to study. So I think with Dr. Fleming's studies, the upcoming studies, and I'm really happy and really looking forward to what is um, with that what she will find out from the studies. So in summary, hepatitis B is the most common cause of liver disease in Chinese Canadians, and liver cancer is the most common indication for transplant in patients with hepatitis B, and live liver donation is uncommon among Chinese Canadians. And I certainly think that have a support group, it is a defective approach to address liver care barriers faced by the Chinese Canadian. And definitely we need more work to improve liver care access. And this work, it should be what I call culturally responsive, like looking into consideration of the Chinese culture and beliefs. So that's all I have to say. So, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, Kalina, thank you very much for this uh, amazing perspective in Chinese communities. I think we 
we learned a lot uh, from your uh, presentation uh, in terms of uh, uh, the cultural barrier and uh, some of the uh, some of the barriers seems to be common with other communities such as you know lack of knowledge about the liver disease the progression of liver disease but some see a lack, you know, barrier in terms of language and access to, to medical care. And there are also some unique perspective to Chinese communities um, based on their cultural belief uh, and uh, uh, that, that needs a specific approach certainly uh, toward this community. And, uh, and we are very fortunate to have you uh, working so closely with this community and I, I am very impressed of all the work that you have established in terms of outreach and uh, and uh, all the um, efforts you put into this uh, point of care and educational uh, toward this community and uh, and um, hopefully these are all valuable information for us as we are moving forward to, to uh, improve access. So I'm going to finish by talking a little bit about uh, living donation. Uh, but before I start my presentation, I would like to encourage again everyone to submit their question uh, through the Slido. And uh, we will try to answer all the questions at the end of this session. And uh, please, please don't hesitate to, to send this question. Um, so, um, talking a little bit about um, access to uh, liver uh, transplantation and living organ donation and uh, what we learned from uh, the presentations this morning. Before I go ahead and present uh, uh, the exciting news in terms of the study that we want to, to initiate to look at the um, access to transplant for our um, immigrant and diverse communities. Uh, just a few words in terms of uh, liver transplantation, our program and living organ donation. So um, the liver transplant uh, program at the Ajmera Transplant Center is the home to the largest liver transplant program in Canada. Uh, we have done over 3,000 adult uh, liver transplants since uh, 1985 when the program was initially established. And up to now, we have done uh, over 900 uh, living liver uh, donor transplants since 2000 when the program of living organ donation was uh, initiated. And that, uh, in that uh, year of 2000, um, our team felt that uh, due to the, to the lack of disease organ donation and the continuous death on the uh, waiting list uh, for patients who are waiting for liver transplant, we need to come up with other initiation and other perspectives and solution and strategies to, to reduce this uh, death on the waiting list for transplant. And, uh, the living organ donation was um, initiated in that year. Um, I must say also, I, we are going to talk a little bit about that in the next slides, but even though um, the living organ donation in the Western countries, uh, definitely um, Canada as pioneer in the Western world for living organ donation started in 2000, it is one of the main um, uh, uh, paths to liver transplantation in many Asian countries, um, because in these countries, cadaveric organ transplantation due to the cultural belief is not possible. So it is not uh, unique to Western countries. It's not unique to Canada. It's widely used across uh, Asian countries. So in 2019, just a few more stats, uh, the, uh, the program, our program has performed over 200 liver transplantation. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud to say that we have performed uh, 60 um, live donor liver transplant uh, last year, 48 adults and 12 pediatric uh, uh, were made possible to do, uh, through the living organ donation. And I'm also very pleased to say that this year, despite the, all the, uh, all the uh, 
um, slowdown in the healthcare system um, across all specialties due to COVID pandemic. Uh, we have done really well in terms of uh, live donor liver transplantation, and we are um, we are um, very close uh, to do 50 live donor liver transplant as we are speaking now, and we are projecting to be um, finishing the year possibly one of the best year in terms of living organ donation. Uh, and again, that is despite the pandemic that we have all been suffering uh, from. Uh, and our uh, UHN transplant program uh, or Toronto General is ranked one of the top five uh, hospitals in, in the world. So what are the benefits of liver transplant? I think that uh, we all have heard uh, from various uh, speakers in the panel this morning that uh, patients develop liver cirrhosis, they have the compensation from liver cirrhosis, they stay in ICU. Um, you heard from uh, Dr. Chandok the, the length of admission to ICU from cirrhosis-related liver disease and the risk of that. And liver transplantation is the treatment of choice for a selected number of patients with liver failure because it allows to improve their health, uh, to increase their life, in, um, uh, prolong their life uh, expectancy, improve their quality of life, um, etc. And however, it is also important to emphasize that not every single patient with liver cirrhosis could be an eligible candidate for liver transplantation. And these are the nuances that uh, one has to be informed. But it's also important to acknowledge that every patient with liver cirrhosis and decompensation should be referred to a liver transplant uh, program so that they have the chance to be, um, to be assessed by the transplant team and, um, and make the final decision in terms of their candidacy for transplant, which is again, their life-saving procedure. So um, this slide basically shows uh, the pathway to receive a liver uh, or any um, liver organ transplant. And I want to say that um, they are not mutually exclusive, and that is important uh, to, to know. Uh, I think there is still a lot of barrier because many people don't believe that if they are on one side, they cannot have access to the other side and vice versa. So the two paths toward the, the liver transplantation, one is through the disease organ uh, donation. Every single patient who is listed in our program would be on the disease organ uh, donation, except perhaps a few specific uh, research protocols. I'm not going to go into those details, but overall majority of our patients are listed on the, on the disease organ donation list. And, um, and that's the path for everybody. But it also means that you have to wait uh, for a deceased organ to become available. The other path to liver transplantation, which would be um, the, the um, in many ways, a shorter um, way to access transplant is through living organ donation. So what does disease organ donation means? It means that you are on the waiting list for transplant in the province of Ontario and, uh, and uh, Trillium Gift of Life, as you all know, is the agency that oversee the organ uh, donation and allocation in the province. Uh, patient, uh, the, the referral and the listing uh, criteria are defined uh, for by Trillium Gift of Life, uh, and the allocation of the organ uh, is through the score that we are using, that's called sodium melt score, uh, as well as uh, based on the blood type and uh, the, bloods, uh, the body size. So this sodium melt score, just to go through it uh, very briefly, because um, all the patients who are waiting for a transplant uh, know or should know about uh, this score. Uh, that is a score that assesses the severity of liver disease 
as well as the likelihood of uh, dying from the complication of liver disease within the first uh, three months after um, the score is um, measured or calculated. The score is very uh, objective. It's based on parameters that are measured uh, in uh, biochemically from the blood. Uh, so there is no subjective uh, definition that this patient seems quite uh, ill. Um, uh, it's uh, based on parameters, uh, four parameters, uh, bilirubin, which uh, is a, a, me a measure of um, the uh, liver uh, function, synthetic function, creatinine, which is a measure of the kidney function, and INR, which is measuring the clotting um, uh, in, the, in the body. And the reason for that is that all the clotting factors are synthesized by the liver. So it's again, another uh, determination of the synthetic function of the liver. And the fourth parameter in this score is the serum sodium concentration. So um, patients with me who are um, listed uh, are listed based on their sodium melt score. Um, these four parameters enter into a formula, a complex formula, and the, the score is generated automatically. And, uh, and we know that uh, patients who is awaiting for a, a disease donor organ transplant requires to have a score um, close to 30 um, uh, currently to be able to attract the organ from a disease pool. And that is regardless what is the blood type. Um, uh, so it, 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 this number is, uh, is uh, roughly uh, about 30 in whatever uh, blood group we are looking at. Uh, listed patient for liver cancer receiving uh, receiving exception point because their sodium melt score at baseline is very low and they could wait for years on the waiting list. So we, al we allocate them every uh, three months uh, uh, exception points to bring them up to the top uh, so that eventually they can receive an organ. And, um, and uh, these scores are updated every month so that it reflects if a patient gets sicker. The second path to the transplant is through living organ donation. I mentioned that, uh, that uh, in many countries around the world, living organ donation is the, in some instances, the only way to receive an organ. That's for example, in Japan, 97% of all transplants uh, is through living organ donation. Similarly in, in Korea and um, India is the, really the, the way to, um, have access to, to transplant. And in Toronto, uh, we, uh, roughly 30% of our activities uh, is through living organ donation. And I believe that this number is rising uh, um, uh, even more. Uh, the benefit of the living organ donation is that uh, that allows access to transplant, to a life-saving uh, transplant with minimal waiting time. Uh, it's a, um, access to an organ that is on much healthier because the, the donor um, that is uh, donating a piece of their liver to a recipient is a healthy donor. They have to go through a very um, specific and careful assessment and uh, only healthy donors are are um, uh, moving ahead with uh, organ donation. And the reason for that is we want to make sure that the, the health of the donor remain intact throughout the process. And therefore a donor has to be completely healthy and therefore the recipient will also receive a very healthy liver. I'm gonna show you very briefly a couple of slides about the long-term outcome of, um, of the uh, recipient of the live donor uh, transplant. And you will see that they are very, very close to, um, to the, the outcome of the deceased donor recipient. And in addition, uh, the, the organ donation and particularly live organ donation has also brings a, a deep satisfaction to donors from saving a life of, um, 
a patient who is uh, who would otherwise die without a liver transplant, and that's something that comes up often during the the discussions. So the, as I mentioned, donor safety is our number one priority. A donor has to be uh, between the age of 16 to 60 years of age to be a donor. You have to be in um, excellent uh, physical, but also emotional health and have normal liver function and support from their family and their friends to go through this process. And most importantly, it's a voluntarily uh, choice. It can be on no way a coercion or force from uh, anybody around them to do this, um, this um, to go through with a live donation. So this is just a study that we are, uh, we are um, submitting soon for publication where we looked at the long-term outcome of adult to adult uh, uh, liver transplant in our program now being 20 years uh, initiating this uh, this um, live donation so um, be 20 years of follow up of the live donors and here I just want to point out a couple of um, a couple of um, numbers uh, when um, you you can see the, the highlighted in red uh, on the middle column is the live donor liver transplant and on the uh, right hand side, the disease donor liver transplant, you can see that the live donors typically are younger by at least a decade from the disease donors. And uh, there is an equal number of distribution in terms of both male and female donors um, in, in both groups. The, there is um, 40, about 45% of our live donors were from male donors. And uh, similarly, about 56% of the disease donor are male. Um, this shows, this slide shows the long-term outcome of the, the um, uh, both patient and graft survival post liver transplant. On the right, uh, left hand side is the patient survival. The red graph shows the live donors the blue one, the disease donor. You can see that during the first few years of uh, post-transplant at five years and 10 years, the outcome of the live donor is actually better than the disease donor's uh, transplant. Uh, just again, because these are better quality graft from younger donor and patients are getting the access to the transplant a lot faster. However, uh, at uh, longer term follow-up, close to 20 years, the difference is no longer seen. And the reason for that is that patients start developing other complications and die from other um, medical condition that has nothing to do with the live donation. On the right hand side is again graft survival and you can see roughly the same, uh, the same results. And the last slide is just to show you the cause of that. And the reason I put the slides up is because I wanted to emphasize on the fact that the cause of death in the recipients of the live donor is very, very similar to the recipient of the disease donor. And there is really no disadvantage uh, in terms of the live donation. So during the discussion this morning with our panel, we have heard about uh, burden of liver disease uh, in various uh, um, uh, community, immigrant uh, and uh, diverse community in, uh, in Ontario, and, um, and how important it is to try to increase access to liver transplant among this uh, community. And I'm very excited to present you uh, the a research study that we have initiated in collaboration with um, Dr. Fleming, uh, with the goal of um, uh, in looking at prevalence and incidence of liver disease and access to liver transplant and living organ donation in ethno-racial uh, communities. That's called the abbreviation for this research study is Access Liver Transplant. And that's a study that is funded by uh, the Canadian Donation and Transplant uh, Research Program. So um, they, the, and it was quite highly, um, highly ranked uh, in, their, um, in the research proposal that they received as being quite unique and very important question to address. 
So um, the aim of our study, you, you have heard it uh, over and over this morning, is to describe the cause of the cirrhosis in the ethno-rational minority patient and change in the incidence of etiology and immigration over time. We want to examine the trends in rates of liver transplant and living donation by immigration status and uh, explore ethnicity, race, uh, immigration, gender, geography, and socioeconomic factors, all the parameters that the panel speaker has raised from various ethno-racial uh, uh, communities in relation to access to living organ donation. And our hypothesis was a uh, patient with end-stage liver disease uh, from immigrant and the ethno-racial minority communities are less likely than other Canadian to be referred for a transplant, uh, receive a liver transplant, be a living donor or receive an offer from a living uh, donor liver. So this was our study. This is a two-phase study. As a first step, um, we are gonna do a population-based study of diagnosis of cirrhosis using the tool that Dr. Fleming um, uh, explained to you on the, from the ICES. And the second part is the intervention part where we will um, reach out to various community the, um, through surveys, fo focus, focus groups, interviews, uh, et cetera. And we are identifying a number of um, questions and interventions to try to access the, the burden and barriers to organ donation and organ transplantation and living organ donation as uh, developed here. And finally, my last uh, slide was on how to do I become a living organ donor. Um, uh, this is through um, complete donor health history uh, submitted to UHN transplant.ca and uh, uh, send along a copy of your blood type um, and uh, wait for to receive a call from uh, our program. Um, this is all the presentation from this morning and uh, we will open now the panel for the discussion and the questions that were submitted through, um, through the Slido. Um, Courtney, do you want to go ahead and um, and uh, read the questions so we can answer them. Uh, hi, Nazia. Uh, so we've received uh, seven questions. Uh, we probably will not get access or uh, be able to answer all of these questions today, given the time. But our first question is, um, in the data looking at causes of cirrhosis among immigrants and refugees in Ontario, do we know when their cirrhosis was diagnosed? Is diagnosis related to the healthy immigrant effect or social determinants of health that cause a decline of health after immigration? And Jennifer, maybe that's something uh, that you would like to address. Sure, yes, thank you for that question. I think it's an important question. We haven't yet looked at that, but we're going to attempt to um, address that specific question. So from the data sets that we have, we know when an individual immigrated to Ontario, and then we know the first date that they were ever defined as having cirrhosis. So we'll be able to, to look and see whether or not they came to Canada with the diagnosis already, or if this was something that developed over time. And certainly you're right, the healthy immigrant effect um, is well known within medical literature and something that we will uh, be looking at. There's also other ways within the ICS data that we try and look at um, socioeconomic status um, and other social determinants of health. There's a several databases, so we're interested in linking to those as well to try and describe that in more detail. So I'm very hopeful that this study will bring a lot, shed a lot of light on um, some of the uh, issues related to the burden of liver disease in immigrant populations as well as access to transplant. Fantastic. So we have a number of other questions, but I am mindful of time. Um, I see there's a question on uh, paired exchange, and then there's one on blood type. 
um, let you know uh, there is a parrot exchange uh, liver exchange program at UHN. Or we did our first uh, uh, the first one um, uh, last year, and we'll be able to provide uh, information on that and uh, answers to the other questions on the list. Perhaps we could just take that um, the the next question and then um, adjourn, or I'll turn it over to to Nasia. But the next question is around blood type. Um, is blood type one of the reasons why some people have travel, trouble accessing transplants? Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer that question. So uh, blood type, yes, is a one could be one potential reason. Um, the organ is allocated based on the blood type. Uh, obviously, a majority of um, the, there is a big majority of uh, population with the blood group A. Therefore, there are more uh, donors from blood group A, but it also means that there are more uh, patients on the blood uh, group A list uh, that are waiting for organ. Blood group B seems, uh, and AB seems to be among the lower um, uh, uh, rates of blood group donors. However, their list is also shorter. So the way we always put it as transplant hepatologists is that at the end, uh, the likelihood that you have to wait for a blood group organ, uh, B organ is possibly not very different from a blood group A uh, or B because uh, there are less recipient uh, on that blood group wait, uh, waiting for organ. Um, uh, and um, uh, um, and there are, uh, even though there are less donors with that blood group. And is it a genetic reason that make them harder? Uh, I, I, um, I guess that the genetic reason means uh, probably liver disease. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what is the genetic reason question here means, but if it alludes to the type of liver disease, Yes, there are some genetic liver disease that make harder access to transplant just because their score does not reflect how sick they are uh, and uh, how, how badly they need a liver transplantation. Terrific. So we'll answer all of the, the questions that's submitted via Slido, and we'll also send a link to everybody who's registered. And I'll turn it over uh, to you, Nasia, for concluding remarks. Well, uh, again, thank you very much uh, to all our panelists uh, this morning for their excellent presentation. Uh, I personally learned so much uh, from every single one of you, and I hope that we are able to um, put all this information together and, uh, and be able to address um, um, the access to liver transplant and have hopefully next year on this time some more uh, information and uh, um, uh, steps that we have taken to address this, um, this uh, disparity or access to transplant. I also want to thank uh, all the people who are listening to us uh, through YouTube uh, today. And uh, all the people, obviously, all the people who have submitted a question, I'm sorry that we ran a little bit out of time and we weren't able to address all of them. I promise we answer all through this uh, slide. -o. And also, I would like uh, that uh, to take a moment to ask everybody to look at the program for this week and try to tune in to various events. Uh, tomorrow, we have an amazing uh, event celebrating the living organ donations. And uh, um, please uh, join us for that uh, event. And uh, throughout the whole week, there are various activities that is organized for, by the center. And um, thank you again, everybody, for joining us this morning.